Um, so in chapter 12, we got through part of it last, um, last week, but I figured I'd just sort of go through a quick um, recap of what we did. So um, just in terms of what we're looking at, it's um, practical details of working with dependencies and in particular how different types of dependencies um, can be used in places like functions, tests, examples, and then vignettes or articles. Um, and there's a little bit of confusion about imports because it sounds like you're importing it, but it doesn't actually import the package. It just installs the package, um, but doesn't make it available to your user. Um, so any packages are listed in imports do not need to appear in namespace. But if you have a package in namespace, it must appear in imports or in depends, which is um, a, those are both fields within the description file. And for the sort of workflow, um, you can use uh, the Roxygen, I don't know, is it R Oxygen too, or is it Roxygen? I have no idea. I only read it, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I always I wonder. Call I call it oxygen in my head. But I yeah, me too. Cool. Let's go with that. I, I just anything that's written in R, I don't know how to say. So I just <laughs> usually roll everything together until it sounds kind of cool. <laughs> um, cool. So yeah, so you can use Roxygen to um, uh, functions, and they can create um, comments within the namespace file um, and in the description file as well, I think, uh, for you. And so the namespace file itself keeps track of how and when to import functions from another package and also to export your functions from your package. So that means making the function that you've written available to users that have downloaded your, your, um, your package. And they're generated from comments in the .r files that are within the R directory. And um, it starts with a comment explaining the Roxygen 2 generation. Um, and they do need to be regenerated periodically. And I think from memory, the way to regenerate them, you can use like Control Shift D or Command Shift D if you're on a Mac, um, I think. Um, I haven't actually given a go myself in, in R yet. Um, then, in general, um, you add your namespace related tags to Roxygen comments. So, yep. And then run DevTools document. That's right. That regenerates everything. And I think you can do that running that DevTools um, document function. You can do using Control Shift D. And that updates the uh, um, help topics and then regenerates the, the namespace. So, for. This is sort of like looking at the description file um, and within the description file, um, there's a field called import. And if you recall from sort of chapter 10, which I, yeah, I think we covered before everything got changed and split, it, uh, split out, um, the imports are needed by your users at runtime and they'll be installed or potentially updated if they're already installed um, when users install your package via install.packages. And you can safely assume that a package list in imports is installed um, whenever itself is installed, sorry, whenever the package is installed. Um, and so when you're in your R files, so in when you're using this in code um, within the R files, um, the recommendation is to use the syntax package dot dot function um, to, and that helps you avoid importing the package to your namespace, um, as well as easy identifying which functions live outside of your package. So this is when you're using dependencies, so other packages um, that you might call upon. So you might be using say dplyr or something like that. Um, and it also eliminates name conflicts as well. So for instance, if you're using um, dplyr and you use the select function, I think there's um, in another um, package, there's a select um, function as well. And those, it might not know which 
name so the passenger user might know which one they're using. Um, but if you do that package colon colon function, um, it helps to avoid that. But there are some exceptions. So an operator can't be called with the, the double colons. Um, so example for that would be the Magrata pipe um, that, um, what is it? The percentage, um, that symbol percentage, <laughs> um, yeah. greater than symbol, is it? Yeah. yeah, greater than that. That's on. Yeah. Um, and also a function, if you use it a lot, um, if you can't, uh, if you're using a function a lot and you're constantly using those colons, um, it can make your code quite unreadable. So in those cases, you might not want to use it. And the other one is a tight loop, like we discussed um, last time. Um, you do get a minor performance penalty because it's constantly looking up that function and then um, then using it. So if you're using, I guess, high performance computing and stuff and you've got thousands of, hundreds of thousands of data to go through, then perhaps not using using that. Um, if you do make an exception, uh, you can generate a Roxygen tag with use this, use it underscore import underscore from, and you'd place that either as close to uh, the usage of the external function um, or in a central location. And they say like, if you're first using it, it feels kind of natural to put the Roxygen tag um, close to the external function. Um, however, as you move, so as you sort of like produce more of this and you have many more uh, packages you might be using, it can get quite confusing. Um, and so they suggest using it in a central location. And that kind of reminds me of um, like when you install packages and then you have your library, if you're just doing, you know, some data analysis, you have like a little section with all the, all of the libraries you're using. Um, mm -hmm. When I first started learning, uh, I remember there was a, a, a sort of example that were given by a professor that had the libraries being called whenever that function was coming up in the code instead of right up the top. And at some point they'd gone back and then added something in above that library call. And so when we ran that piece of code, it create an error, which got quite confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess having it all in that centralized location helps remove some of that confusion. Yeah. Um, and as a user, it helps you see what you, what libraries you're going to yeah. use. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so for the, um, when you use that, <laughs> use this, use this function, um, the use import from, it also updates the documentation and calls load all, um, which loads everything into the, the namespace, I guess. Um, and importing the entire package into namespace should be rare and is the least recommended. Um, so an example would be um, in tidyverse. Oh, sorry, these are supposed to be bullet pointed lists. Um, I need to go back and fix those. Um, so an example would be in Tidyverse, they use Arlang a lot. And in that situation, they import the whole namespace from Arlang into Tidyverse. And that's only done because they rely on those um, functions so heavily. Um, it does make your, it can make your code harder to, to read um, and increases risks of function name conflicts if you name functions the same as theirs or you're using another package that has um, functions in it. So the next section was um, how not to use a package in imports. Um, and when I first read this, I, I kind of, I read it as um, this is what you shouldn't be doing, but it actually means um, if you've got something in imports, but you don't actually use it, how you can make it still work. So it got me a little bit confused when I first read it, but then now I realize what they're, they're talking about. Um, so sometimes say you have a package listed in your imports field within the description file, but R thinks you don't use it. Um, and so that kind of situation, um, you might, it might just be in the default for a function argument in your package, which I didn't quite understand how that works. I don't know if you, if you have an idea. No, no I <laughs> yeah. don't know. 
Yeah, I thought an example might be helpful in this one, but I, yeah, I couldn't come across myself. But basically, if if that happens, we, we should add it to the yeah questions. for Jenny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think um, it's so. I think it's like if you have it in a function, but it doesn't explicitly get called um, when our CMD check. So I think like if you're uploading it to CRAN or something, when it does that R CMD check? It can give you the a note saying check dependencies in our code, and then it gives you a note saying namespace and imports field not imported from that package. Um, all declared imports should be used. Um, so it thinks you have listed a package that isn't being used when you are in fact using it. And so to get around that, you basically just create a function like a dummy function, I guess, um, in your R folder. And that function doesn't need to be called and it shouldn't be exported. And it looks, um, hold on, I'll just get up the, the book to show you what that looks like. Thought I had the um, code in there, but. So you could create a function that just says like ignore unused imports. Um, and then you just have the function that you're calling in there. And then R thinks, oh, they are using that, that um, function from that other package and won't give you that um, error message. Um, there is another way of doing it. You could um, import the package into namespace. Um, which is one way of doing it. However, then they will also load the package as well. And whilst it probably won't matter, um, it, they say it's best practice to minimize the loading of packages until they're actually needed. Um, cool. Yeah, so, I think I had, yeah, uh, I had that, I use the targets package. I don't know if you use it. But no, no. It, it's like a, I don't know, like a work, it, it, it makes your code into a workflow. And so it oh. figures out your own, your dependencies and only runs the code that has changed. And so uh, you, you specify the, what packages you want it to load. And I had an issue once because a, a function uh, only use a certain library uh, or a package uh, when it it threw an exception, but uh. it 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 only so my, my code was running fine, but when it, it finally uh, had an error, um, it threw the exception and the um, like the the package wasn't loaded because it it never really. Uh, it wasn't being used for a, for a while, so I think that's similar to what's happening here. Like yeah. if, if if you if you the function never like R doesn't check uh, th that exception, so it never finds the the function. Yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah. There's there's another case like that. Um, what is it? Oh, like if you're using Ren. Um, our environment mm -hmm. or whatever it's called um, to save all your packages and stuff. Um, it automatically de detects what libraries you're using. But I think if you then, if you have a bunch of files and then you do like source these files and it runs through everything, if you're using the library within those things, it won't detect them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it, it's, you know, smart to a point, but then there's some things you've just got to help it out with. Yeah. yeah. So have all your libraries in like the the file that's running source rather than um, in those other other files. Yeah. So in the test code, and oh man, I remember learning about test driven development a long time ago, and it's just I found it all very confusing. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to the those next chapters. Um, but in test code, it's generally um, your know, external functions in a test are referred to in the same way as the code below R. So you'd call your um, a, a P 
your, you know, your packaged colon colon function name. Um, but you shouldn't use something like library um, function, uh, sorry, library package in your tests. Um, and that's because it apparently changes the search paths for your tests, um, makes them different to how your package would work, which is bad. But I don't know why it's bad. Um, I'm guessing we're going to learn about that when we get to the tester and yeah. about, or the, the um, tests section. Yeah. Um, and then for examples and vignettes, um, if you use a package listed in imports um, in your example vignette, um, you'd either need to attach the package with library AAP KG or um, use the that sort of um, double colon call to pull them out. Uh, then, cool. So that was for the um, that was for the imports um, field within the description file. Uh, the next section's on the suggests field within the description file. Um, so again, going back to chapter ten. And the packages listed in suggests are either needed for development tasks or they might unlock optional functionality for your users. Um, so what you can't assume is that every user will have the package installed, um, but you could assume a developer would. And if you did want to install those dependencies, um, when you do that, the install, if you're a user, um, you do install.packages, the package name, and then you put in a uh, argument dependencies equals true, and that will then download and install everything from that you'd find within that suggests field. Um, so in code below uh, the R folder, so like your .r files and stuff, you can check for the availability of a suggested package um, using require namespace um, and then the name of the package and quietly equals true. And there are two scenarios where you might use this require namespace. Um, one is if the package is required, um, you can have a function, it checks if that package is installed. If it isn't installed, it will return an error message saying you must include um, it, the you know the code that includes calls such as this and you don't have that function installed. Um, the second option would be to if the package was optional, um, it can check to see if it's there. If it is, it does something using that pack, uh, function from that package. If it isn't, it has a fallback method where it does a different process for the user. And so our lang has um, useful functions for checking package availability. Um, and it can offer to install the package, um, which gives sort of an interactive element for a user. And there's also programming functions it has that I don't quite understand. Um, there's stuff around vectorization, vectorizing over a package, um, which I no R has lots to do with vectorization, but I don't quite understand how R lang helps with that. Yeah. Do you have any ideas on that, functions? No, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and <laughs> vectorization is still like a, an abstract <laughs> concept to me. Yeah, yeah. I know it's really good for like, yeah, having long data sets and all that kind of stuff. And it makes mm -hmm. things a lot quicker to process, but um I think I need to go and do the advanced star book. Yeah. <laughs> I think that would have been helpful prior to this. Um, prior to this. Yeah. Book. I can do after. Um, so that's for code that's in that R folder. Um, but if you're in your test folder, um, including packages from tests when writing, sorry, from suggests, um, the suggest field in the description file when writing tests, that depends on 
maintain a developer preference. So the Tidyverse team, they say they generally always um, write tests as if all suggested packages are available. Um, the test set package, um, when you use it, is in the suggest field. So they assume that all suggested packages would be available, um, but they would skip sometimes if that package is cumbersome to install and not already installed. So um, an example they gave was in ggplot and there was an SF package, which I think is a geospatial one from memory. Mm -hmm. I know when I've tried to load like either SF or leaflet, one of the two, it takes mm -hmm. forever to install. So I, I suspect yeah. that. Yeah. I, I got a new M1 Mac. And oh my god, yeah. I tried to install that package and I don't know. I gave up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's definitely um, definitely something to to avoid. And the way they suggested you can avoid that in your tests, which we'll again learn about in a couple of chapters time. Um is that um say you're doing your test set call, um you'd have a function. And you could have this thing called, it's from test set called skip if not installed. And so you'd say skip if not installed SF. And if it wasn't already installed by the user, it would just skip that test and wouldn't run it. Um, which I guess is, yeah, saves people having to sit there and wait for 30 minutes while something installs. Yeah. Cool. Um, in examples and vignettes um it says an uh, example is a common place to use a suggested package um and it's probably one of the few within an example would be one of the few times you'd use a require or require names uh, space um uh, call in a package and I think so from what I understood with require will it will install the package and then attach it. So it's like doing the install.package and then the library kind of thing. Um, whilst require namespace, I think just loads it but doesn't attach it. Um, yeah, sorry, require loads and attaches. Require namespace just loads it um, but doesn't attach it. Um, so require is like the library call, but it's built so you can use it in functions. Um, and for vignettes, um, a vignette package, again, it comes down to like choice of the maintainer developer. Um, the Tidyverse folks, they um, suggest because a vignette needs things, they're kept within a suggested field like um, Nitta um, and something else as well um, because you'd be loading those then other the other packages presumably would also be loaded and therefore um, they say we can assume all suggested packages are available and use suggested packages unconditionally they use this term a, a few times in in this book um, like conditionally or unconditionally but i couldn't find where they defined what they meant by that um, so I'm guessing it's just that they have, that you can use them as you like without possibly having to do the, um, that call. Yeah, without checking. Yeah. 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 Again, that's something I think, yeah. Um, I need to go back and see if I can find it out elsewhere. I just know they've changed this chapter a bit. So I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if they thought they had it, but. They haven't actually defined it. Um, anyhow, um, if you did want to do things conditionally, then the knitter chunk option eval can be used, but they discuss that further on in a later chapter. Um, cool. So for packages, they're listed in depends. Um, so this. Apparently, this is something that it came like back in the old days of our depends was the only way you could um, depend on another package. And but since later releases, um, 
that's no longer the case. You use um, the imports field mm -hmm. instead of depends field. So back in chapter 10, it says that the most legitimate current use of depends is to state a minimum version for R itself. So depends are greater than 4.0. Um, and depends shouldn't be used for packages. But if you did use it for a package, and sometimes there is reasons for it to, to use it, um, it'd be somewhat similar to imports in that the package can assume that that, um, that dependent package will be installed. Um, but unlike imports, the package will also be attached as well. Um, so available to then call the functions directly from, from it. Um, so in this situation, code below R and in test code, they're pretty much the same. Um, you just use the same as using functions from a package listed in imports. Um, you use your double colons to call it. Um, and you'd import an individual function just using one of the at import from Roxygen tags. Um, or you could import the entire namespace if you wanted to using just the at import Roxygen tag. Um, in examples of vignettes, because you, when you run an example, um, the package would be attached and executed, so you wouldn't need to use library in that situation. Um, if your vignette starts with library in the name of your package, your package would be loaded and attached along with any packages listed in the depends field as well. So, yeah, it's um fairly similar to imports, but the big difference is that things will be attached, not just loaded. So for a package with a non-standard dependency, um, this was getting a bit out of what I understood, but it's, it's basically um, dev tools may have some non-standard fields um, that it puts into your description file. Um, and, and one example of that would be the remotes field. And that can be used to install packages from a non-standard location like GitHub. Um, but you'd still need to declare the dependency in the correct description field. Um, so for example, in imports, um, so you could have your remotes and say install blah -de blah package from username at GitHub. Um, but you'd also need to list that in the imports field within that description file as well. Um, then there's the config for slash needs for slash asterisk field, which yeah, I I didn't quite understand. Um, they were, were referring to a much later chapter. Um, it looks like it's for uh, things we have true runtime dependencies. So I'm guessing it's where things update and then GitHub Actions picks up that it's updated and then updates something on a website. That's what I got the impression of. Um, do you have anything, do you, do you have any ideas on those? Or? No, I haven't used it. Maybe also for like shiny apps. Yeah, something. that's a good point. I think it's things where there's, there's like a interaction and things are running mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, it does say it's only for really specialized development tasks. And it said, I think it's mentioned um, package websites as well. So I'm wondering if it's like, if something updates, then GitHub Actions picks up on it and then changes mm -hmm. the website, something like that maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. It sounds fairly niche anyway. I don't think I'd be using yeah. it in my package. <laughs> uh, yeah, this one, this chat, I, so it talks about exports. And basically, if you don't have, um, you could, have, when you first create your package and you write a function, if someone were to then load your package, they wouldn't be able to get access to that function. Um, unless you've exported that function. And the, the part, this part of the book 
it doesn't actually mention how you export the function. I don't recall that from I previous chapters. I think chapter. it's with the uh, Roxygen tags. Yeah, because so there was a Roxygen export. Yeah, tag, there's yeah. an add export. And if you, I think if you don't have the tag, it doesn't, well, I think exporting is putting in the in the namespace or the description. I don't know, but yeah. if if the Roxygen tag isn't there, so when, when you run the document, uh, the I think uses or the tools. I don't, I don't remember which package. Yeah. Document function, it won't pick up the like the function and put it in the right in the. I don't know if it's the description or the import. Yeah. 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 I think that was in the dev dev tools the um the document one yeah, yeah. it um yeah because I, I went in and had a look at, um I can just share this actually I had a look at a namespace file is there an easy way to change oh new share there we go that's better so I went in and had a look in this um namespace thing and you can see they've got all these export um tags there so that those would all be functions that i can use um they do mention that you don't always want to oops they do mention that you don't always want um every function you create accessible to the user um and it's better to have too little than too much because once people start using functions, mm -hmm. um, if you then need to change them or things like that, it can break other people's stuff down the line. Um, so yeah, it's good. You, you basically want, when you're exporting something, you want it um, to be a function that others can use. Um, it should have really good documentation um, to explain what it is. And um, you shouldn't, change like the inputs in the function later on or how people interact with that function later on because that can break other people's code um and so they it kind of goes back into the philosophy of packages as well which is um their package should be for a defined reason for a defined problem that you're solving and it should do that thing really well um and sometimes you might have functions that are useful for you, your package to run, but the user never needs to see. Um, and in those situations, you can um, place them into a utils.r file um, so that they're within there, but they're not available to be called to, to uh, by the user. Yeah. Oops. I want to let me go to the next screen. Uh, hold on, I'm just going to re do this for some reason. It keeps sticking whenever we get to this slide. Just one moment. Yeah, did, do you remember? Did they um, talk about exporting earlier on? I think. I think. Maybe I think it was in the whole picture book, oh, yeah. in the chapter, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So re-exporting. This is where it all gets very convoluted. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> um, you want to make available a function from another package. So a package that you're dependent on to your users. Um, so it's basically you're making that function or object available um, and it's actually provided by one of your dependencies. So to do that, you'd list the package that um, hosts the re-exported object in the imports field in your description file. And in one of the, um, the R files within the R directory, you'd have a reference to that tag function and include the import and export Roxygen tags. And then you'd regenerate the namespace and that should mean it would be available for the users to then use. 
Um, but they will also, um, when you do that, it will also generate a um, in the manual folder, so the man folder, um, a re-export stuff. Um, markdown file um, where basically it keeps a record of all the re-exported objects you've used and links to the documentation so if the user needs to go and find you know what that function is and where it goes it can get it easily this will work yeah and this is about where it, it was i didn't really understand it because i don't really understand s3 i don't know if you do yeah. No, um, I don't. I, yeah, I've read I it think like that's six times. An, <laughs> yeah, that's an advanced R yeah, yeah. topic. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. As um yeah, I, I read it a few times and didn't really make sense. I get and for my package, I'm not really doing much with S3. Um all I could understand. So S3 was um is something that gets used a lot in this book and in um high diverse stuff as well um and most our users would probably use that but then there's also s4 and r6 which more specialized people might use so like people that use bioconductor for bioinformatics they use s4 objects and r6 i think again comes up a lot in high diverse from memory um but yes, it says the main thing I got from it was that if your package does own an S3 class, it makes sense to export a user friendly constructor function. And it had a bunch of code to show you how to do that. Um, but it was slightly beyond my my abilities to understand what was going on there. Um, yeah. Have you done much with S3? No, I I don't that I don't pay attention to the those. No, um, I think I, 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 because I'm, I'm usually doing data analysis, so I just use the <laughs> the packages yeah, mostly so, from the tidyverse. And, yeah, yeah, and that targets a package, which I really recommend if you have like large analysis, uh, and you have to load uh, a like really big data that takes a lot of time, but. Yeah, this is like all abstracted away by those packages. Yeah, yeah. I definitely see like S3 come up in like some of the error messages that come out. Or if you go mm -hmm. into, um, sometimes when you go into some of the objects and look behind the scenes, it has S3. But yeah, it's something I've always been, I've always known was there, but never really delved into yeah. it if I know what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so I think that's that's basically where I got up to there, which is basically the end. There's the last part of that chapter. Um, yeah, it's quite a it's quite a I don't know, wasn't like the most I guess exciting chapter. Yeah. Suppose, but um obviously quite important. <laughs> Yes, it, especially if you need to use other packages in the yeah. package. One of the things that definitely, um, definitely did find quite interesting was, was um, just like, it kind of made me understand how, because I've always wondered, like you know, when a when you do install dot packages, it installs it, and I was always like, why do I then need to call library to, yeah, to like. Well, and this kind of goes into a bit of that, which I found interesting. It's, yeah, that's just something I've always wondered since I was an undergrad. Yeah, um, and the thing about uh, calling the dependencies equal true when we were selling packages, I yeah. wish I'd, I'd known that like two months ago when I was helping someone install <laughs> all the packages we, we needed because yeah, yeah we yeah. had to run through. <laughs> All the missing dependencies. Yeah, it's so much easier now if you can just use that dependencies equal true. Yeah. 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 Um, what else was there? I guess for next week, we don't have anyone for licensing. I was going to do licensing today because that's something I know a bit about. <laughs> it would have been nice, <laughs> but um, 
I'm away next week, so I don't know if anyone's available to do that. Maybe I'll put in the Slack message unless mm -hmm. you want to to do it. Yeah, I, I don't. I have to check my schedule because the holidays are a bit yeah crazy. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if we should just postpone next week. Cause I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know what it's like for you, but basically between Christmas and New Year's, everyone yeah. normally goes <laughs> on holiday. But yeah. I'm yeah. Yeah, that week like doesn't ex exist yeah. in time. <laughs> <laughs> I know in the US, I don't think they get many public holidays, so maybe they they do go back to work. But, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Hi, uh, Olu with me. Hi, good morning. Sorry, my time I miss the time. Hey. I had another presentation and I set up my alarm. And my alarm did not notify me. I just checked my time. Now it's almost past. I'm so sorry for joining late. Ah, oh, no dramas at all. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> you have to really <laughs> wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what time is it? Like two. It's already in the morning to four. It's to four. Three oh. forty something in the morning. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> already the Bayes rule. I made a presentation. I think last night. So uh, I set up, and it did not notify me. Yeah, no drama. I mean, good on you for getting up at all. <laughs> yeah, I will not be able to wake up. Yeah. Yeah. I think so we're like busy. I think I cannot because I will be off. Till next year, I will not yeah. be joining next week. No problem. I might put in the sack there because I'll be away. Yeah. You're away, Lua family. Are you away as well, sir? I, I don't know yet. Um, I, I'm still checking if we're going to go like somewhere or if I'm going to stay home. Yeah, no problem. Perhaps I'll just put in the sack there um, yeah. to check whether people want to keep going ahead next week or, or not. Sweet. Okay. Well, I've got lots of typos to fix up in my <laughs> slides and then um, get them up to, to GitHub. But yeah. Is there anything else yeah. um, people or any questions people had about the chapter? Uh, not yet. I, my goal is to start my package uh, next week. So yeah. that I will def definitely have more questions once I start. Yeah. I've just managed to get most of my functions written. And I think that that was the part that was taking me the longest. Um, so now by, I feel like to to create your package, you kind of need to have your functions already. Um, mm -hmm. So now I'm going to sort of give it a go, get um, use this going and create my folder and all that and put them in, see what happens. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, I already, I don't have my functions, but I have an idea of what I want because I, I have to make a package at work, but I decided that I'm going to start with like building in public and using like public data and then uh, using it to build uh, at work. So I, I'm just going to use the like the workflow they, they say to, to write one function and the documentation and checking. Yeah. I will see how it goes. No, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. The docu documentation part, I think I'll be fine at <laughs> <laughs> all the other bits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Well, well, thanks for coming along anyway. And, uh, yeah, thank you, Neil, for representing. No worries. We'll so see you all. Um, we'll see you. Yeah, oh, next yeah. year, I guess. <laughs> yeah, next year. Everyone have a okay, safe holiday. Bye. See you next year. Yeah, see you in the new year. Yeah. Happy holidays. <laughs>